Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, the European Union's trio presidency of 2020 and 2021, that is Germany, Portugal and Slovenia, have invited the exhibition Crimes Uncovered, the first generation of Holocaust researchers for an online presentation. Thank you very much for this opportunity and for the greetings that we received from the Foreign Office in Berlin and from the permanent representations of Portugal and Slovenia in Brussels. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. For a long time, for far too long a time, many people did not believe just what atrocities human beings are capable of, did not believe how the National Socialists could disenfranchise, persecute and murder the Jews of Europe. The magnitude of the crimes was so unimaginable that many people who experienced the Holocaust and people who survived it made it their life's work to document these crimes and to bear witness. One of these people was Rachel Auerbach, who died in Tel Aviv in 1976. Rachel Auerbach was born in a small town of Lanivtsi in Ukraine in 1903. She studied philosophy and psychology and later lived and worked as a journalist in Warsaw. When the Jewish ghetto in Warsaw was established in 1940, she ran a soup kitchen there and worked for Emanuel Ringelblum's underground archive. Unique documents were collected and hidden in metal boxes and milk cans to document the horrors of Nazi persecution, but also to chronicle Jewish life. The idea of remembrance followed Rachel Auerbach throughout her life, becoming her career following the end of the war. In 1954, she set up the Oral Testimonies Department at Yad Vashem in Israel and in 1961 was a witness in the Eichmann trial. We owe a debt of gratitude to pioneers like Rachel Auerbach, Emanuel Ringelblum, Louis de Jong and many others who put their lives on the line to collect testimonies. Testimonies to the machinations of the National Socialist criminals who sent millions of people to their death trying to erase their story forever and then hid all traces of these crimes. We can be grateful to these early Holocaust researchers for ensuring that they did not succeed in doing so. They collected facts, documented acts and preserved evidence, even while the crimes were still taking place and sometimes at great risk of their life, they investigated the dreadful horrors of the Holocaust and laid the foundations both for Holocaust research and for the prosecution of the perpetrators. They founded the first archives and research groups and tried to draw the world's attention to the atrocities. Countless people became perpetrators and contributed to this betrayal of all civilized values many out of conviction, others completely blinded and riled up by years of anti-Semitic propaganda. Only a very few of them had to answer for their actions once the war was over. Thanks to the efforts of the early Holocaust researchers, at least a few of those responsible could be brought to trial and held accountable. Through their work to document events, enable the prosecution of the perpetrators and remember the victims, the early Holocaust researchers wanted to ensure that it would be impossible for such a genocide to happen ever again. This exhibition sheds light on the life and work of 20 of these pioneering Holocaust researchers and keeps their memory alive. I would like to thank the House of the Wannsee Conference, the Wiener Holocaust Lab Library in London and the many committed students of Turo College Berlin who together designed this exhibition. 
This cooperation allowed many young Holocaust researchers to preserve the legacy of the first generation of Holocaust researchers. I am delighted that having presented the exhibition in Berlin and a few other cities abroad, we will be taking it to the heart of the European Union, to Brussels, hopefully in the second half of the year, if circumstances allow. Looking at the early Holocaust researchers reminds us once again of the European dimension of the Holocaust. They ensured that the fates of the individuals hidden behind the numbers are not forgotten. They helped us to learn lessons from the past and to build a Europe in which war and hatred have no place. Today especially, when people at the heart of our societies are denying and playing down the Holocaust and falsifying history, it is incumbent on each and every one of us to defend the achievements of European integration and to take a decisive stand against racism, anti-Semitism and discrimination. We made a contribution to this end during our chairmanship of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance with the establishment of the Global Task Force Against Holocaust Denial and Distortion. Let us continue to work for a world that remembers the Holocaust, a world without genocide. I would like to thank uh, Michael Klaus, Germany's permanent representative to the, United, to the European Union, for the kind invitation for the Portuguese presidency to contribute to this event. I believe it is quite fitting to place the online launch of this exhibition about the first Holocaust researchers within the framework of the trio of European Union presidencies, which Portugal shares with Germany and Slovenia. Indeed, in the TRIO program, uh, which we jointly wrote, our three countries, and I quote, commit to enhancing coordination of the work of the Council in preventing and combating anti-Semitism, especially with regard to exchanging best practices. I think the work of the first generation of Holocaust uh, researchers, which this exhibition highlights, as a direct link to the European Union's daily work for two main reasons. First, because the European project was built on the physical and moral rubble of the Second World War and on the lessons learned from the greatest genocide in history. We therefore owe much to those brave people like Simon Wiesenthal, dedicated their lives to a tireless search for knowledge and justice including during periods of Europe's post-war history when many wanted to forget rather than remember the Holocaust. The second reason why the work of Holocaust research pioneers is so precious and needs to be brought back into the light now has to do with what we have been increasingly witness, witnessing online, in speeches and on many streets in Europe the resurgence of anti-Semitism, including of the violent kind. To the extent that in some places in Europe, many Jews are again afraid to walk the streets bearing the signs of their faith. In the program of the, of the Portuguese presidency, we place the promotion of equal opportunities and combating uh, all forms of discrimination high on our list of priorities. For example, on April 20th, we organized an online high-level conference with the title Protection from Racial Discrimination and Related Intolerance, Anti-Semitism, Xenophobia and uh, anti gypsyism With the participation of uh, Michel Bachelet, United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, Margaritis uh, Schinas, uh, Vice President of the European Commission, and Portugal's Minister of Justice, and Catherine uh, von Schurnbein, European Commission coordinator on combating anti-Semitism and fostering Jewish life, to name just a few speakers. This event, built upon the TRIO program, 
and followed the initiatives of the German presidency in the fight against discrimination, particularly the fight against anti-Semitism. To conclude, I would like to again thank our German friends for inviting the Portuguese presidency to take part in, in this event and to commend the organizations behind this exhibition, the Van C Conference Memorial and the Educational Site, and Toru College in Berlin, in cooperation with the Wiener Library uh, London. Their work helps keeping alive the memory of those that made sure Europe won't forget. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, the Vanza Conference, held in secrecy nearly eight years ago and the tragic events that unfolded in its aftermath, clearly demonstrates how fragile human dignity can be when hatred and prejudice flare up and consequently affects millions of lives. The commemoration of 27 January National Holocaust Memorial Day is one of the main activities in Slovenia aimed at keeping the memory of the Holocaust alive. There were over 75 events this year under the traditional yearly umbrella project Shoah, we remember, mostly virtually due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Since the early days of International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance membership in 2011, the Republic of Slovenia has actively applied the principles underpinning the Stockholm Declaration and supported all main objectives of the Alliance. Slovenia's biggest achievement in the year since our Alliance membership has been the continuity of public discussion, research, education and museum activities related to the Holocaust, the genocides of the Roma and a more contextualized approach to the history of World War II. These well-established activities have considerably raised public awareness of the history and the consequences of the Holocaust and genocides of the Roma particularly on the territory of Slovenia. For several years, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has also supported the issuing of publications setting light of these historical facts. The Slovenian government has adopted the Alliance legally non-binding working definition on anti-Semitism in December 2018 and the working definition on Holocaust denial and distortion in February 2020. The experts from the Slovenian delegation to the Alliance have been actively involved in the development of the working definition of anti-Gypsism and anti-Roma discrimination, thus supporting the efforts of the German presidency of the Alliance. Slovenia has also been a staunch supporter of the UN principle of the responsibility to protect, which focuses on the activities related to preventing risk and identifying indicators and triggers of processes which could lead to mass atrocities including genocides. Tragic experiences from the past should never again be repeated. Yet, in reality, we see that racist and anti-Semitic crimes increasing at alarming rate and COVID-19 pandemic unfortunately added its share. Similarly, we hear anti-Semitic conspiracy theories in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Such occurrences may subsequently lead to acts of violence and hate crime and should not be underestimated. Just the opposite, they must be carefully considered and addressed accordingly. And I would also like to take this opportunity and announce that during the upcoming Slovenian presidency of the Council of the European Union, the Ministry of Justice will hold a high-level conference in October this year to discuss effective ways of combating hate crime and hate speech. Particular attention will be paid to combating hate speech online and the protection of victims of hate crimes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your greetings. The student curators of the exhibition from Turo College Berlin will now present several biographies filmed at the Memorial and Educational Site House of the Wannsee Conference with an introduction by the academic supervisors Stefan Lehnstedt and Hans-Christian Jasch. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Stefan Lehnstedt. I'm a professor for Holocaust studies at Turo College Berlin. At Turo Berlin, we have a, a Germany's unique master's program for Holocaust communication. And we do this in cooperation with the House of the Wannsee Conference. 
And out of this cooperation emerged the idea of starting a joint project dedicated to Holocaust communicate to Holocaust research, the only early Holocaust research immediately after the Second World War. And we investigated how these women and men were interested in commemorating the Holocaust, the victims, how they were interested in researching the Holocaust and how they also were interested in justice, that is, persecuting the perpetrators. And out of these topics, uh, these topics led us to 21 biographies of early Holocaust researchers that we then presented in a joint exhibition project. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Hans Christian Jasch. Um, I'm the former director of the Memorial Educational Center House of the Wannsee Conference. Uh, I'm a lawyer by training. Um, I focused a lot on perpetrator research. And for me, this was a very important project to put a stronger focus on uh, the victims. I'm a bit hesitating with the term victims because uh, the researchers uh, which we have presented in this exhibition are not only victims, they also showed their actorness by collecting evidence, by um, preparing the memory of the Holocaust and by taking measures to prevent mass atrocity crimes. Uh, and I thought it would be interesting, and I think this is particularly interesting in such a context in Brussels, uh, to focus on the role of Holocaust survivors in shaping uh, the post-World War II world order and our understanding of international public law and the creation of international criminal law. Um, and in this context, uh, I was, uh, was a very happy match uh, with Stefan Lehnstedt uh, and his uh, class of very engaged uh, students uh, to look also at the forensic research of the Holocaust, to look at those who started to collect evidence of the crimes, evidence which the Nazi perpetrators had tried to destroy. Um, and um, which became the basis uh, for the judicial reckoning, but also for the uh, commemoration uh, of the Holocaust. And I think this is an aspect uh, which should not be overlooked. Our knowledge about the Holocaust today relies on people like Josef Wolf, who lived here in Charlottenburg uh, after the war. And he made it his mission to educate the Germans about the role of different parts of German society in the persecution and the murder of the European Jews. Um, he was also um, the one who initiated an international association uh, shortly after the Eichmann trial in 1965 um, which had at, uh, as its uh, objective to create a research center in Wannsee, in the House of the Wannsee Conference, in order to record the Holocaust and conduct research. Uh, Josef Wolf, um, in the end, uh, was not successful in his efforts. Uh, the Berlin authorities, the then mayor of Berlin, uh, was afraid that Wannsee would become a place of worship for uh, right-wing extremists. Um, there were many demands at the time to uh, destroy Wannsee as a place of, of shame. Um, and Josef Wolf eventually in 1974, after the death of his uh, wife, uh, who had also survived in hiding uh, in Poland, uh, committed uh, suicide. He left uh, a letter to his son uh, David uh, in which he uh, literally said, in Germany you can document yourself to death. Uh, the perpetrators will still continue to uh, garden their little gardens and water their, their roses. Um, and for me it's a particular pleasure uh, that we can dedicate this exhibition to the work 
of Josef Wolf. Um, we are here at his uh, living place in post-war Berlin and also the place uh, where he took his life in 1974, also out of frustration with the course Germany was taking in terms of reckoning with its Nazi past. Josef Wolf published the first documentary works on the Holocaust in German. He confronted the German society with the crimes. Born in Chemnitz, Wolf grew up in Krakow, where he received a rabbinical education. Between 1941 and 1943, Wolf was active in the resistance in the ghettos of Krakow and Bognia. In 1943, the Germans deported him to Auschwitz. During one of the death marches of 1945, he was able to flee. His wife and son survived, hidden by a Polish farmer. After the war, he worked for the Central Jewish Historical Committee in Poland for two years. In 1947, while living in Paris, Wolf co-founded the Center for the History of Polish Jews. During his stay, he met Leon Polyakov, they would go on to publish several books together. Leon Polyakov founded a center for research on the Holocaust in France. He also published extensively on the subject of Nazi perpetrators. Polyakov was born in St. Petersburg. After the revolution of 1917, his family emigrated to Paris, where he studied law and literature. He then worked as a journalist and together with his father published a German language exile journal. In 1940, he was captured by the Germans as a French soldier. He managed to escape shortly thereafter. Polyakov joined the Resistance and participated in rescuing Jewish children. In 1943, working together with Isaac Schneerson in the French underground, he co-founded the Centre de Documentation Juive Contemporaine, CDJC, Center for Contemporary Jewish Documentation a historical commission to document the crimes against French Jews. Today, it is part of the Memorial de la Shoah, the central Holocaust memorial site in France. Polyakov acted as an expert advisor to the French delegation during the Nuremberg trials. In his function as the director for research at the Cité Jésus, he explored the systematic destruction of Jews. His publication, Le Brévière de la Haine, Le Troisième Reich et les Juifs, Preview of Hate, the Third Reich and the Jews, in 1952 offered one of the first comprehensive studies of the Holocaust. Between 1955 and 1958, Polyakov and Josef Wolf published three volumes of documents on national socialist perpetrators in German. Until the day of his retirement, Polyakov taught at the Sorbonne and researched anti Semitism and racism. From 1955 until his suicide in 1974, Josef Wolf lived in Berlin. He researched the history of the Holocaust and the culture of the destroyed Polish Jewry. In his publications, Wolf focused on German sources to better educate German society about the crimes committed in their name. He named the perpetrators in various sectors of society, which was met with great resistance in German post-war society. Wolf also tried to found a research institute on National Socialism and its aftermath at the house where the Wannsee Conference had taken place in 1942. Wolf did not see his efforts come to fruition. The memorial and educational site House of the Wannsee Conference was only established in 1992. Its library bears his name. Rachel Euerbach established survivor reports as a foundational component of Holocaust research. She was born in the Galician city of Lanovce and studied philosophy and psychology in Lvov in the 1920s. She then moved to Warsaw and worked as a journalist. 
In the 1940s, Euerbach ran a soup kitchen in the Warsaw Ghetto and worked for Emanuel Ringelblum's underground archive Eunik Shabbos, Joy of the Sabbath. Euerbach managed to escape in 1943 and survived in hiding. After the war, she continued the work of the Ringelblum archive at the Central Jewish Historical Commission in Poland. Euerbach ensured that within a short period of time, parts of the archive were retrieved from its hiding places. Emanuel Ringelblum was the founder of the underground archive Oynik Shabbos, Joy of the Shabbat, in the Warsaw Ghetto. In the 1920s, Ringelblum studied in Warsaw. He wrote his doctoral thesis on the Jewish history of the city. Following his studies, he worked at Jewish schools and at the Jewish Scientific Institute in Vilna for several years. Ringelblum was interested in the socio-economic aspects of the Jewish history of Poland. In addition to conducting research, he provided his services to charitable and political organizations. Following the German invasion, Ringelblum was forced to live in the Warsaw Ghetto. He decided to document Jewish life and its persecution for future generations within his underground archive, Oynik Shabbos. It was important to Ringelblum that the archive also bore witness to the strength and courage of the imprisoned Jews. Ringelblum and others, like Rachel Auerbach, brought together sources, conducted interviews and produced analysis. Facing the unremitting threat of the deportations to Treblinka extermination camp, they buried their extensive collection in metal boxes and milk cans. This prevented the archive from falling into the hands of the Germans or getting destroyed. In 1943, Ringelblum went into hiding outside of the ghetto with his wife and son. A year later, they were denounced and eventually shot inside the Pavia prison in Warsaw. The archive was retrieved in large parts after the war. Up to this day, his extensive collection is one of the most important resources for Holocaust research. It is housed at the Historical Institute in Warsaw, which bears Emanuel Ringelblum's name. In 1947, Rochel Euerbach published the report entitled Auf die Felder von Treblinka, in the fields of Treblinka, a comprehensive account of this extermination camp. In 1950, Euerbach migrated to Israel, where she headed the Yad Vashem Eyewitness Accounts Department. She fought tirelessly to secure a place for victim survival experiences in the history of the Holocaust. Euerbach viewed her commitment as a natural obligation in consequence of her own survival and as a responsibility towards those who were murdered. In 1960 and 1961, she supported the preparations for the trial against Adolf Eichmann and testified in court. Quote, in my opinion, Dr. Ringelblum was the first to start with the writing of a great indictment and there is a direct path leading from that place to this courtroom. End quote. I chose the biography of Emanuel Ringelblum, the founder of the Oynik Shabbos archive, because it obviously is an extraordinary story of Jewish resistance and courage. It was motivated by the desire to record the history of the Jews in Warsaw based on their experiences in the ghetto. It was important to Ringelblum to gather testimonies that expressed a variety of perspectives from all points of the political, religious, and ideological spectrum of the Jewish society and the German occupation, and even from children. Ringelblum himself wrote, it must all be recorded with not a single fact omitted. And when the time comes, as it surely will, let the world read and know what the murderers have done. I chose Rachel Auerbach in Yiddish Rachel Euerbach because I wanted to highlight the contributions of female researchers to the field of Holocaust studies. And to give credit where credit is due, I have learned that Rachel Euerbach has worked tirelessly to ensure that survivors' testimonies be treated as historical documents. Without her, the Eichmann trial could not have taken place in the form it did, and without her, survivor accounts would not receive the attention they deserve today. 
Massimo Adolfo Vitale dedicated his life to tracking and recording the names of deported Jews from Italy and the Aegean Islands. Vitale was born in Turin and studied law there. He was a decorated World War I veteran and was stationed in Eritrea, Somalia, and Libya as an Italian colonial officer. Forced to give up his position due to the Italian racial laws, which entered into force in November 1938, Vitale sought refuge in England, in France, and in Morocco. In 1944, he returned to his home country. His mother and sister were murdered after their deportation from Turin. Upon his return, the Committee for the Finding of Jewish Deportees recruited Vitale to lead its research efforts. He organized housing, aid, and food for the returning Jews, and he attended the trial of Rudolf Höss, commandant of Auschwitz, in Warsaw in 1947. Following the trial, Vitale made several visits to former concentration campsites and began his research in Poland. In 1946, he wrote The Persecution of the Jews in Italy, 1938 to 1945. In this report, Vitale stressed the responsibility of the Vatican and the Catholic Church in abetting and aiding the Italian fascists. Drawing on his investigative work, he presented a list. 7,496 Jews were deported from Italy and the Aegean Islands, and only 837 survived. Beginning in 1955, Vitale worked for the Center of Contemporary Jewish Documentation in Milan. He dedicated his time to fighting anti-Semitism in Italy and in Poland. Particularly interesting about his biography is his tireless and never-ending effort to take on one of the most established institutions of his time. Members of the Catholic Church were not only deeply entrenched in collaborating with the Nazis and their own racist ideology, they also played a role in perpetuating stereotypes. After prolonged communications with church leaders in Poland, Vitale succeeds in two momentous achievements. One is the removal of several church paintings that depict acts of blood libel. The second is to have the Archbishop and Primate of Poland, Wyszynski, remove incendiary language in the sermons on Good Friday. These sermons contain 71 references to Jews being responsible for Jesus' death. It is these types of interfaith communications that need to continue today and in the future. Vasily Semyonovich Grossmann and Ilya Grigorievich Ehrenburg published the Black Book, the most comprehensive documentation on the extermination of Soviet Jews in the German-occupied regions. Grossmann and Ehrenburg both originated from assimilated Jewish families from the Ukrainian part of the Tsarist Empire. Before the war, they were already successful writers. During the war, they worked for the army newspaper Krasnaya Zvesta, Red Star. Beginning in 1943, while working on behalf of the Historical Commission of the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee, JAC, Grossmann and Ehrenburg collected evidence of German crimes. Publications of diaries, letters and reports appeared as early as 1944. These descriptions of the ethnically cleansed Ukraine, Belarus and Poland, as well as of the Treblinka extermination camp and the Majdanek concentration and extermination camp, are among the first eyewitness accounts of the Holocaust. In 1946, they wrote a comprehensive account of the Holocaust in the Soviet Union, which became known as the Black Book. However, it was not printed, since anti-Semitism was gaining momentum in the Soviet Union. The JAC was dissolved, and numerous members were arrested and murdered. Grossmann and Ehrenburg were spared because of their prominence. In 1948, a first edition of the Black Book was published, but it was heavily censored. It was not until 1994 that the original uncensored manuscript was published in German translation. The book testified to the mass murder of about 1.5 million Soviet Jews. Eva Reichmann, a 
prominent German historian and sociologist who fled Germany in 1939 became the director of research at the Wiener Library, where she researched German Jewry and anti-Semitism. She led a project to gather more than a thousand testimonies of Holocaust survivors in the 1950s. Born in Upper Schlesia, Reichmann grew up in a liberal Jewish home. She studied economics in Breslau, Berlin, Munich, and Heidelberg, where she earned a doctorate in 1921. She married the jurist Hans Reichmann in 1932. In the years from 1924 until 1939, Reichmann worked for the Zentralverein Deutscher Staatsbürger Jüdischen Glaubens, the Central Association of German Citizens of Jewish Faith. In Berlin, she also worked for the Jewish Agency, as well as the Reichsvertretung der Deutschen Juden, Reich's representation of German Jews, together with Leo Beck. Following her husband's release from Sachsenhausen concentration camp after the events of November pogrom in 1938, the couple fled to London in 1939. Her research on Nazi anti-Semitism was published in 1950 as Hostages of Civilization. From 1942 to 1943, Reichmann worked for the BBC's German Listening Service after which she became the director of research at the Wiener Library. There, she led an ambitious effort to record Holocaust survivor testimonies. Over seven years, with financial support of the Jewish Claims Conference, Reichmann and her team gathered reports from refugees and survivors in Britain and abroad. The project gathered more than 1,300 reports in seven different languages. Reichmann belonged to the Belsize Square Synagogue, where she received numerous honors for her work. She died in London in 1998. Eva Reichmann's life spans an entire century. She made bearing witness her life's mission, and not just her own life's mission, but she encouraged others to speak up. We all bear witness, Eva Reichmann declared in a poignant appeal published in the Bulletin of the Association of Jewish Refugees in 1954. And already in 1954, or perhaps especially in 1954, a mere nine years after the end of World War II, Reichmann saw the memories of those lost as being threatened. We all have a duty to fulfill towards our past. Political developments on a global as well as on a Jewish level are not too auspicious for keeping alive the memory of German Jewry, she said. Through her work of collecting eyewitness accounts, Reichmann initiated topical research questions that resonate for us today. Namely, her process of interviewing witnesses and carefully cross-referencing historical data as well as temporal and geographical facts, highlighted questions about concepts such as historical truth. Today, public and private research institutions, such as the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum or the Shoah Foundation of Visual History Archive, collect data with more advanced technological means. However, questions addressing the degree of mediation in visual and audio eyewitness accounts feature prominently in the 21st century discourse on historical truth and authenticity. This in part is due to the legacy of Reichmann's work as a tireless researcher. Reichmann kept a balance between her duty as a conscientious scientist and sociologist on the one hand, and her obligation to giving survivors and their memories a voice on the other. It is this delicate balance that makes Eva Reichmann such an important female figure for our times. Simon Wiesenthal began his hunt for Nazi perpetrators in 1945. Wiesenthal was born in Buchach, Galicia. He studied architecture in Prague and worked in Wolf. During the German occupation, he survived 12 different camps. In 1945, he was released from Mauthausen concentration camp in Austria. Shortly thereafter, he compiled a list of 91 names of SS members to those crimes he could testify. 
He handed the list over to the U.S. Armed Forces and offered his services to the American authorities looking for Nazi perpetrators. Since 1947, Wiesenthal continued his work independently in Linz. There, he founded a center for Jewish historical documentation. In 1961, he moved to Vienna, where he opened the Dokumentationszentrum des Bundes Jüdischer Verfolgte des Nazi-Regimes, Documentation Center of the Association of Jewish Victims of the Nazi Regime. Wiesenthal tirelessly collected evidence and testimonies. Although the Austrian authorities hardly supported him, Wiesenthal was successful in bringing numerous perpetrators to trial, including Adolf Eichmann, Franz Stangl, commandant of Treblinka extermination camp, and Franz Murer, also known as the Butcher of Vilnius. Since January 2017, Wiesenthal's holdings are open to the public at the Wiesenthal Institute for Holocaust Studien, Wiesenthal Institute for Holocaust Studies in Vienna. A glance at the majority of publications on the Holocaust gives one the impression that mainly men documented and researched the subject. Additionally, the existing structures and networks are also linked to the names of male founding members, the Wiener Library in London, the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw, named after Emanuel Ringelblum, and the Wiesenthal Institute for Holocaust Studies. However, there were female researchers in all of the commissions and institutions that gathered documents, recorded survivors' reports, and published their findings. These female researchers were driven by the same motivations and beliefs as their male co-workers, and they worked side by side. Many of their works were published in Yiddish or Polish, which for a long time contributed to a lack of reception in the West. Even in communist Eastern Europe, a place of professed nominal equality between men and women, female workers seldomly reached leadership positions. Thus, public perception to this day focuses on male directors and leaders. This exhibit, too, is a reflection of this. It is due in large part to the historical transmission. There is a greater amount of biographical material and publications by and photographs of men in central positions. This, however, does not mean that women contributed any less to the judicial work and to the commemoration and research of the Holocaust. Even numerically, these female pioneers were on equal footing. It is their contribution that built the foundation of Holocaust research today. Ada Eber received her doctorate degree in history from the University of Lvov. She survived the war in hiding. She later joined the Jewish Historical Commission in Poland, offering valuable contributions as one of the few professional historians. Eber met her husband, Philip Friedman, at the commission. Together, they emigrated to the US. She contributed to her husband's scientific research. Her work was indispensable for the extensive list of publications that appeared under his name. Despite this, Eva was not considered as an independent researcher in her own right. Nella Rost worked as a journalist. During the war, she survived forced labor, the Krakow ghetto, the nearby concentration camp Plaszow, and a prison sentence in the notorious Krakow prison Montelupich. She was head of the Krakow branch of the Central Jewish Historical Commission of Poland before migrating to Sweden in 1946. While in exile, Ross led another historical commission for the World Jewish Congress. In 1951, Ross emigrated to Uruguay. Genia Silkes worked as a teacher in Warsaw before the outbreak of the war. She founded various underground schools in the Warsaw ghetto and participated in the group of Oynik Shabbos. She was able to flee during the ghetto uprising. After the war, Silkes worked for the Jewish Historical Commission. She was also actively engaged in the rebuilding of schools in Poland. Beginning in 1949, she worked as a researcher for the Jewish Scientific Institute, first in Paris and, after 1956, in the US. Thank you for the presentation of the biographies of early Holocaust researchers. I will now hand over to the director of the House of the Wannsee Conference, Deborah Hartmann, who in a panel talk will speak about the lessons and legacies of early Holocaust research with Ambassador Michaela Küchler.
from the Foreign Office in Berlin, and Bini Gutmann, who is president of the European Union of Jewish Students in Brussels. Yeah, good morning. Um, so in the next 20, 25 minutes, we will be discussing the legacy and aftermath of the pioneer work of these early Holocaust researchers and their impact on European memory, culture and identity today. And so the main, the main aim of our conversation is therefore to connect the topics and questions raised uh, by this exhibition with present day challenges. What is the relevance of these important early initiatives by Jewish survivors today, which intended to document the suffering of the Jewish people in the 20th century? How does this affect the ways we deal with the history and memory of the Shoah? How we talk about its impact on our present societies and how we remember the efforts of those early researchers and the difficulties they faced in making the world realize the extent and impact of the committed crimes. And I'm very honored uh, to discuss these and other questions with Michaela Küchler, who currently serves as the special representative for relations with Jewish organizations, issues relating to anti-Semitism, international Sinti and Roma affairs, and Holocaust remembrance from the German Federal Foreign Office, and with the president of the European Union of Jewish Students, uh, Bini Gutmann. Um, so the exhibition Crimes Uncovered was created for the 70th anniversary of the UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. And for researchers and activists like Raphael Lemkin and Herr Lauterpacht, who are introduced in the exhibition, the juridical implications of the Shoah were of significant importance. They were of utmost importance in the development of central aspects of the law of nations and created the basis for prosecuting genocidal acts and crimes against humanity. And their own personal experiences, not only as survivor, survivors of the Shoah, but also as witnesses of antisemitism and how minorities were treated in Europe before the Holocaust, were instrumental for the initiative. Um, Michaela Küchler, where are we standing today concerning the protection of human rights? Did the world develop effective measures for the prevention of genocides? And does the specific experience of the Shoah continue to play any role in this? Yes, good morning. And thank you, um, Deborah Hartmann, for, for this uh, very interesting uh, question. Uh, we, 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 uh, always repeat that we must learn the lesson from the Holocaust. The Holocaust was something that was singular. It was a single event, uh, also because of its bureaucratic and industrial execution. But if you look around in our world today, we still see men and women and children being systematically persecuted and murdered only because they belong to a certain ethnic, ethical um, group or to a, to a certain religion. That means that the exhibition on the early Holocaust researchers is, 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 very, um, is very actual. It, it, it has something to tell us today. Um, when it comes to, to Germany, um, the land from the country from which these crimes were planned and executed, we have developed in the uh, in the decades after World War II a policy um, to actively support the efforts of the international community to prevent genocide. Um, we were a member of the United Nations Security Council in 20, 2019 to 2020. And we actively contributed to ensure that these efforts are always present in, in the United Nations Security Council. We know from our own historical experience that the, um, that the meaning of a uh, persecution by penal law is is very important for future prevention of, of genocide. And that is why Germany is really um, supporting all initiatives and launching also own initiatives to um, prosecute um, 
men and women who take part in, in genocide. We, uh, we, we were and we are an active supporter of the International Court of Criminal uh, Justice in, in The Hague, um, which just completed 20 years of, of, of action. Um, there are still places in the world where this International Criminal Court of Justice uh, cannot, uh, cannot work because the, the relevant states did not sign the, the convention. Uh, and in these places, we, um, we are engaged to found in, uh, international independent um, mechanisms to investigate uh, acts that could be genocide and uh, put together facts which will be um, which will enable a future uh, uh, procedure in, in criminal law. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, in many biographies bi in many biographies presented throughout this exhibition, the fight against antisemitism plays a central role. Uh, Alfred Wiener, for example, actively contributed to the anti-antisemitic activities led by the Zentralverein Deutscher Staatsbürger Jüdischen Glaubens, a very important Jewish-German organization before the war. Um, Nachman Blumenthal emphasized that, I quote, everything we do is a weapon in the war against fascism and antisemitism. And also for Leon Polyakov, the understanding of antisemitism as an essential element of the Shoah was instrumental. And he explained in his, his own motivation, I wanted to know why they wanted to kill me alongside with a million other human beings. So they all basically aimed for a better understanding of antisemitism. Um, Bini Gutmann, today we are facing a significant increase of antisemitic violence in Europe. Um, so where are we currently, currently standing with our efforts to prevent contemporary forms of antisemitism? Um, thank you very much and thank you very much for having me. Um, yes, it is unfortunately true. Uh, recently, we have really seen a very worrying um, rise in antisemitism all over Europe and actually around the world. Um, in early 2019, the European Union, on advice of UGS, conducted a study um, that showed that almost half of young European Jews had themselves experienced antisemitism in the last year, um, which is a hugely high number. Um, since then, unfortunately, since early 2019, when the study was conducted, um, the situation, unfortunately, only has gotten worse. Um, with, the, with the corona pandemic in the last one and a half years, um, we have seen a, a very dangerous rise of conspiracy myths and conspiracy ideologies, and together with it, the biggest far-right mobilization that we have seen in many European countries um, in at least my lifetime. Um, I'm, I am, I'm not a very old person, um, that is fair, but, but I still am living for 25 years now, um, and there was no um, such far-right mobilization in my lifetime at least, and I think even if we go further back, um, this is quite a scary development. Um, at the same time, um, more recently, in the last few months and weeks especially, we have really seen an explosion of Israel-related antisemitism. Um, together with the latest escalation um, in, in Israel and, and, and Palestinian territories in Gaza, um, we really saw, saw a shocking rise of antisemitism really throughout Europe. We saw mobs um, in, in Europe's streets um, shouting, fuck the Jews. Uh, we, saw, we saw mobs um, shouting um, slogans that, that in the end meant that they wanted to kill Jews. Uh, we, saw, we saw Jewish houses of worship um, being attacked and being desecrated. Um, and, and we saw, and, and that leads me to, to my next point, which can be part of the answer, we saw really an explosion of antisemitism online, which actually has left many Jews um, to actually leave social media platforms, at least for that time. Um, and those are scary developments. But at the same time, I wouldn't say that all is bad. Um, Europe is not a wasteland of antisemitism, as, as people sometimes think when they look at it from the outside. Um, overall, overall, the issues that Jewish people are having are, of course, um, concerned with antisemitism, but they also go beyond that and the issues that everyone else is also facing. Um, but what I think is different right now and, and what needs to be part of the solution is, is what happened on the Internet, is what's happening on social media. Um, because antisemitism was and probably always will be there and will be part of our societies. Um, but, but right now we really see a very dangerous spread of antisemitism on social media. Um, and of course, we see the spread of antisemitism on social media on fringe platforms like Telegram channels, like 4chan and 8chan, which are very hard to regulate. 
Um, but that is not where it's starting. That is not um, where the main problem is in my eyes. The main problem starts before that. The main problem starts on mainstream platforms. And those are platforms that we can regulate and that we can reach. Um, because for instance, um, 60% of people in QAnon, that anti-Semitic conspiracy ideology that, that, um, that rose quite sharply in the last few months, and 60% of people in QAnon groups on Facebook that have now been deleted after two and a half years, and were actually led there by Facebook's own recommendation algorithm. So that means that people didn't want to go into these groups, people didn't search for these groups, but Facebook led them to become members of these groups. Mm -hmm. um, and that is something that is hugely dangerous because I don't think many people wake up and decide to join a neo-Nazi channel on Telegram just one day after the other, but it's a process of radicalization that starts on mainstream platforms. So that's what we need to start urgently to regulate um, and to change um, because internet um, online um, anti-semitism online is not something that stays online as uh, as really a wave of attack has shown in the last few months and years mm, so what would you suggest what can be done especially from your pr perspective like being like from the perspective of the european union of Jewish students and you have maybe from your brussels um, so, so, so actually this is a good point um, i also said before that not all is bad and actually the european union is right now working on a strategy on combating anti-Semitism for the very first time, a Europe-wide strategy. Um, and together with a number of other um, Jewish organizations in Brussels, we've actually released a set of recommendations, um, a 12-page document, on which steps um, we think are important to be taken in that development. Um, when, it comes, when it comes to regulating social media platforms, um, I think it's actually holding them accountable. Is actually making them making them pay if, if they let hate foster on their platforms. It is making the algorithms more transparent. It's making them transparent and showing us um, why that can happen, why these algorithms lead people on pathways to radicalization. Um, but it's in the end, it is holding them accountable, something that is not happening right now. And um, I think more broadly speaking, the Iron Working definition of anti-Semitism, Michaela Küchler is obviously here um, and, and can tell you probably a lot about it, but the Iron Working definition of anti-Semitism is really an important tool in the fight against anti-Semitism. Um, because in order to fight anti-Semitism, we first need to define it. Um, and actually, in the last few years, we saw a number of, of first countries and governments, but also more recently, um, civil society organizations, football clubs, sport organizations, to actually start adopt the Arab working definition of anti-Semitism, um, which is obviously only a first step, but a very important first step, because as soon as we can name and define anti-Semitism, it is easier to fight it. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, the introduction in the exhibition's catalogue by um, Hans Christian Jasch and Stefan Lehnstedt summarizes, I will quote again, there is a certain amount of tragedy in the fact that all the results of this pioneering work were forgotten for such a long time and that they only celebrated a rediscovery at the beginning of the 21st century. So actually without this early research and the unprecedented efforts of the pioneering Holocaust researchers, uh, basic historical knowledge about the process of the so-called final solution would have been different, delayed, or maybe even lost. And the exhibition illustrates the importance of the survivors themselves speaking up and demanding to be heard. Uh, Ambassador Küchler, considering that the, the, vo the voices of these important witnesses will soon be gone, what could be done to preserve their memories and experiences and guarantee that um, we will continue to listen to them. So what is their relevance uh, today? Yes, well, I, th I think it was a real treasure that uh, in the last decades, survivors started speaking about uh, their experiences. And uh, that made many people, uh, especially young people, were very much impressed but by what the survivors had suffered, had gone through and how they had overcome the, the suffering they had experienced. Um, it, we will have to, to deal with the fact uh, that they will soon, soon be gone. And um, what is important about our future remembrance is we have to stick to the facts. Remembrance has to rely on facts and not on suspicions or uh, I have heard of. No, we have to go back to the facts. Uh, we have some technical means to make the survivors heard also in the future, like uh, films, videos, uh, also oral testimonies. Rachel Auerbach, 
who was part of, uh, of the group and who is being represented, of Emil Ringel, Lingelblum's group and who is represented in the exhibition, she herself founded the oral testimony archive in Yad Vashem. So we, we, we have technical means to, to, to make them heard, but I think that also um, uh, memorials and museums will gain importance. Um, uh, the second and maybe also third generation of, uh, of relatives of, of survivors will, will be more important in, in the future, but it is very, very important always to stick, to stick, to, to, stick to the fact. And that is why in the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance last year, we founded a group, a global task force to counter Holocaust distortion. Holocaust denial is an issue that was relevant, I would say 20 or 30 years ago, but Holocaust distortion is something that is really going on, that is really going viral in the internet. And once again, it is the, the internet which is really bringing that, that process uh, forward. And it's a really worrying trend because Holocaust distortion is a very crude form of also of anti-Semitism. And uh, that's why we, we founded this, this group and the, the group um, published recommendations um, for policymakers uh, and decision makers to counter and to combat Holocaust distortion. And we, uh, within the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, we are now organizing a series of, of seminars and materials and um, social media campaign uh, in order to make these recommendations known so that, uh, well, a very broad public can make, can make use of them. But as, as, as to the survivors, I think we will have to, to, to resort to technical means, written uh, memories. Many books have been written. Um, the USC Shoah Foundation project, the um, Association of Jewish Refugees uh, testimonies collected by, the, uh, by this association. Uh, also, since you mentioned uh, Alfred Wiener, the Wiener Library, which was founded by him in, in London after the war and which the German government supports um, financially. Also, these uh, institutions can and must play a role in, in, in remembrance, but also in transferring the lesson from the, from the Shoah, from the Holocaust to our uh, reality today. And we must always watch out and I think this exhibition um, makes a big contribution to, um, to, to making a relation to the facts and to making a relation to those who collected the facts and who um, testified about what they experienced in, in the Holocaust. I think we owe it to these people um, that we keep their, their memory alive and that we keep their um, well, they have given us a task and we must fulfill that task. Um, the exemplary case of the early Holocaust research pioneers also demonstrates a unique reflection of themselves as simultaneously being witnesses, participants and historical observers. And it's actually up until today um, for me very impressive to recognize how much these researchers were dedicated to scientific objectivity and nonetheless avoided an emotionless and distance, distance form of descriptive reporting. So from that point of view, they were not at all like uh, their German counterparts. Um, Bini Gutmann, to what extent are those pioneers a role model for Jewish activists today? Um, can they serve as an example for the necessity of empowerment and for the importance of developing strategies to combat anti-Semitism, to enable and improve Jewish life in Europe today? Um, yes, absolutely. And, and actually, I'm going to say something a little bit counterintuitive here. Um, because I think one of the great things about the exhibition and also about learning more about the Holocaust research pioneers is that we do that in a holistic way, um, showing the full extent of their work and, and also their lives. And that is actually something that is, I think, quite important also when it comes to fighting anti-Semitism in Europe. 
Um, because very often we talk about the Jewish life and the Jewish communities and, and, and in general, Jewish people in Europe, we do that in the framework of anti-Semitism and we do that in the framework um, of the Shoah. But we do not really talk about contemporary contributions um, of young Jews, of, of, of Jewish communities, of Jewish people to contemporary um, life in Europe. And I think that is a big problem because obviously and preserving the memory of the Holocaust and researching the Holocaust is absolutely important and crucial um, to what we are doing today. And obviously fighting anti-Semitism um, is something that I, that I do almost every day and is something that is obviously also very important to preserve Jewish life in Europe. But I think that if we want um, in the long term that the Jews become normalized um, as, part of Euro uh, as part of European civil society, we actually need to start talking about Jewish contributions in other fields. We actually need to showcase that Jews are not just something that existed in the past. It's not just something that we read about in our history books, but it's something that is actually shaping Europe until today. Um, and then I think that is something that, that we can do by, by showing these Holocaust research pioneers in a holistic view. And then I think the second point um, of, of how they can serve as role models is um, they have shown that the Shoah of the Holocaust is a singular event, uh, which cannot be compared to anything else. At the same time, and Ambassador Kuchel said that before, um, the world did not decide to stop conducting genocides after the Shoah was over. And um, there have been a number of genocides after the Shoah. And, and unfortunately, there's also um, genocides going on right now. And these Holocaust research pioneers, um, for instance, Raphael Lemkin, um, they did not only focus on, on preserving the memory of the Shoah, but also on making sure um, that we actually have measures in place to prevent genocide. Um, and that is something I think that especially young Jews um, can really can really take um, as an example. Because for instance, we at UGS, um, we has, have as one of our core principles um, that human rights are Jewish rights and vice versa. Uh, meaning that we can only fight for Jewish rights if we also fight for human rights. Um, but also that, that fighting for Jewish rights has always has to be part of the fight um, for human rights. Um, and for that reason, um, we think it is important um, that we as young Jews actually stand up if genocide happens today. And for that reason, one and a half years ago now, um, we launched a campaign entitled Never Again Right Now, um, campaigning against the Uyghur genocide that is happening right now in Northwestern China, something that is in Europe very seldomly talked about. And we were actually one of the first organizations, um, unfortunately, um, to start talking about that. Um, and then we think that we, on the one hand, as a Jewish organization, as young Jews, we have a very special platform because people listen to us more when we talk about preventing genocides, but we also feel that we have a special responsibility um, because we know what happens um, when the world stays silent when genocide takes place, and we feel that that is something that we need to change. Um, of course, and of course, the Shoah remains a singular event, but there are lessons that we need to draw for our lives today, and I think that is something that can serve as role models um, for young Jews today. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Vinnie Gutmann. And this leads me actually to my last point and my last question. Um, so you spoke already about um, um, implications like universalism and particularism, for example, yes. And Jewish survivors also played a crucial role for the development of a specific culture of commemoration after the Shoah of course, often facing severe resistance from politicians and the public. Um, Michaela Küchler, you mentioned it before, the Wiener Library, for example, in, in, in London, which was established by Alfred Wiener. We have other examples, Isaac Schnerson and Luyen Polyakov initiated a center for contemporary Jewish uh, documentation, which is today part of the Memorial de la Shoah in Paris. And another example would be Josef Wolf, who wanted to establish an international documentation center for researching National Socialism and its aftermath in the House of the Wannsee Conference in Berlin. And actually for all of them, research about the perpetrators was, was a crucial point. And they conducted this research from the perspective of Jewish historiography, motivated by the desperate question, um, who will write our, our history actually? Um, um, so maybe a last question to both of you. What are the implications of the central role the Jewish Holocaust research pioneers played in the awareness of the unprecedented character of the Shoah and the development of a European culture of commemoration. So how does their legacy affect the ways that we deal with the history and memory of the Holocaust in Europe today? Well, um, 
first of all, let me thank uh, Bini Goodman for what he just said as an answer to your to, to your to your question. Uh, I, I fully agree that uh, that it, 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 especially in in Germany, it is time to realize that Jews did not only exist in the period from 1933 to 1945, that there was Jewish and flourishing Jewish life uh, before, and that there is Jewish life afterwards. And we have this wonderful um, celebration year, uh, 1,700 years of Jewish life in, in Germany that has started in March uh, this year. Unfortunately, many events only are possible online but it really gives a huge insight into the contributions of Jews to, to every aspect of, 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 of life in the, in the German lands. And uh, that is something, uh, something very important to have such a, yeah, such a positive image and such a realistic image also about uh, Jews living, uh, living in, in, in Europe. Um, as I see it, I, 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 I have the impression that when it comes to a European remembrance culture, we are still, uh, we're still at the beginning. Um, we have remembrance cultures in every single member state, but coming together and having a common remembrance culture besides uh, all European member states um, celebrating or commemorating on the 27th of, of January, um, I don't think that there is much in common. I have very much hopes into, uh, into the development uh, of this area, uh, which is starting now at the European Commission uh, with the first ever uh, strategy, European strategy to combat anti-Semitism, but also with the financing of projects uh, to remember the, the Holocaust. And I guess that uh, as it is always the case within uh, European projects that these are going to be projects not restricted to one country but um, two or three countries taking part and I, I very much hope that this will contribute to a better understanding of our different remembrance cultures but also uh, to, to the development of a, of a European uh, remembrance culture um, and, uh, and I, I think that is very important because we must listen to what uh, the, the group around Immanuel Ringelpunkt about the early uh, Holocaust researchers have to tell us, I think it must have been the, the frustration of, of their lives that they tried to communicate the evidence uh, to, uh, to the outer world, uh, to, to the allied forces, and they were not heard. And uh, that is something that must not happen again. Um, yeah, I actually agree with Ambassador Küchler. I think we're quite far from a European um, remembrance culture. And I think actually on the contrary, um, recently we've really, really seen a step back. Um, we've really seen quite a sharp rise um, in the glorification um, of, of Nazi collaborators. Um, in many countries, um, especially in countries that, that used to be behind the Iron Curtain, um, we really saw this development recently. Um, where Nazi collaborators were regimes and also individuals that, that worked with the Nazis, that, that conducted crimes during the Holocaust through a part um, of the Nazis machine of death, um, actually now celebrated and glorified as anti-communist freedom fighters. Um, and we see these huge gatherings um, where, where, the, where the Croatian Ustasha state is honored, um, where, where, the, where the Hungarian fascist state is honored, um, where the Ukrainian, where Ukrainian um, Nazi collaborators are honored and so on. I could give you more and more examples. And I actually think the first step, if you want to build the European, um, if you want to build the European culture of, commemor of commemoration, we need to actually start working against these marches, against these glorifications of Nazi collaborators. Because as long as you, as you glorify someone who has actually um, worked with the Nazis, who has actually been part of conducting the Holocaust, and we cannot work on that remembrance culture. Um, but more broadly speaking, I think what is needed um, is actually a little bit more action. Um, because, because I have the feeling that it is very easy to put together um, a meaningful and, and nice um, and long um, commemoration event about the Holocaust. People come together on January 27th in parliaments around Europe um, and, and listen to important um, speeches um, and so on. But then very little action is actually taking place. 
Um, and I think, I think that actually, actually remembrance um, has to has to mean action today. Like it has obviously, it has to mean um, to remember what happened in the past, but it also means drawing lessons. And that means that we actually need to um, to set meaningful steps against anti-Semitism today in Europe and against racism more broadly. But that also means, and I think, and, and I mentioned that before, that we need to stand up um, for human rights and especially against genocide around the world. And I think that is something that I would wish for if we were to work on European culture of commemoration of remembrance. Um, yeah, and maybe when we speak about lessons and legacies and our, about like the um, establishing a European culture of commemoration, so maybe also these Holocaust research pioneers can serve as role models because they had, of course, a very um, strong transnational um, perspective from the beginning. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for the very interesting talk. And um, yeah, have a good day. Thank you very much for having thank us. You. Thank you very much. Dear Deborah Hartmann, dear Michaela Küchler, dear Benny Goodman, thank you very much for your talk. We would now like to invite you to visit our online exhibition. You can find the link to the exhibition underneath this video. We present 21 biographies and many more texts, documents, photographs on the online exhibition. We present it in German and in an English version. You're welcome to visit it and thank you for following our online event. Goodbye.